How many of you have already broken your New Year's resolution? How many of you decided that because 2020 was so awful, you didn't need to make a resolution for 2021? <laughs> New Year's resolutions actually have religious origins. The practice of New Year's resolutions came in part from the liturgical season of Lent, that 40 days before Easter, and the practice of Lenten sacrifices. But it is seen in other traditions too. Babylonians made promises to their gods at the start of each year that they would return borrowed objects and pay their debts. During the Jewish New Year, Rosh Hashanah, one is to reflect upon one's wrongdoings over the year and seek and offer forgiveness. Resolutions are a good thing, a promise that we will attempt to change for the better, be healthier, kinder, more aware. Resolutions are sort of like calls, a calling, a calling to try something new, a calling to be kinder, a calling to be more courageous, a call to use our gifts in ways that perhaps we had never imagined, a call to reconsider where God is calling us both individually and corporately as a church. Of course, one of the most famous call stories is from 1 Samuel, when Samuel, who is just a boy, is called by God. Samuel's call story actually begins with his mother, Hannah. At a time when women counted their worth by their children, Hannah was childless. Deeply grieved, she prayed that she might have a son, and she promises God that if she had a son, she would dedicate that son to the Lord. And God answers Hannah's prayer, and she bore a son and called him Samuel. And Hannah was faithful to her promise, and once Samuel was weaned, she took him to Eli the priest to the temple. But things in the temple were not so great. Eli was up there in years. It says his vision waned. Eli's sons, while they were also training for the priesthood, were not so good. They stole money and were committing adultery. The text says they did not know God. It's not too surprising that our text opens with the words, the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. Clearly not. But God had not abandoned them. God calls Samuel. Now this part of the story we know so well. Samuel keeps hearing something or someone call him, and he assumes that it's Eli, and he runs in Eli's room proclaiming, here I am, and Eli tells him to go back to bed. It isn't until the third time when Eli realizes what is going on that he instructs Samuel to respond with, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. And that is exactly what Samuel does. This part of the story we know so well. And this is usually where we stop because this is enough text to wrestle with. This is enough to have us wondering, how is hearing God's call so easy and obvious for some? Because that may or may not be everyone's experience. But we press on. At first thought, one might think that a clear calling from God is incredibly exciting. No doubt that it is. It's like a new resolution and we settle in with anticipation and dedication. I've got this. I'm ready, God. Speak for your servant is listening. And then the Lord says, see I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears it tingle. And we lean in. Yeah, yeah, 
Keep going, Lord. Speak, for your servant is listening. I have told Eli that I am about to punish his house forever. Wait, what? We're not too far past Christmas to recall the Christmas classic, A Christmas Story. In the movie, the main character, Ralphie, sends away for his little orphan, Annie, decoder pen. He, ex he is so excited when he receives it in the mail that he can't wait to get working on decoding his first message from the radio show. He is tingling with excitement. And he locks himself in the bathroom and begins decoding the first message, only to learn that the message he receives is not what he wants to hear. While Ralphie is learning some hard lessons about marketing and propaganda, Samuel is learning that the message he so yearned to hear is difficult and scary. Samuel's first message from God is not all about the great things that he will accomplish, but the challenging message that the man who has raised him, his mentor, his teacher, will be punished. This is not only difficult news, but this is likely not the ear-tingling message Samuel wants to receive. Oftentimes, what God is calling us to may be difficult. Sometimes what God is calling us to is deeply uncomfortable. Samuel is so deeply uncomfortable that he laid awake all night. The text says Samuel is terrified to tell Eli the next morning. Now we have all been there holding on to the news that we have to tell someone something that, that we dread, telling your spouse that you want a divorce, the sickening anticipation of waiting to get an acceptance letter or any letter from your first choice of colleges, sharing the news that you have to let someone go, or even telling your boss that you've accepted a new position. We know the kind of discomforting news that keeps people up at night. We've been there. Poor Samuel, as young as he is, is terrified to tell Eli. But Eli knows. Eli knows the news already. He is aware of what his sons have done because he confronted them in chapter two. He is aware that his house will fall because another man of God has already prophesied against Eli's house that, quote, all the members of your household shall die by the sword. As soon as Eli realized it was God calling Samuel, Eli knew the message Samuel would re receive. Surely Eli knew that he was on borrowed time and in what might be his last true pastoral prophetic wisdom. Eli encourages Samuel to not hold anything back. He encourages Samuel to share the Lord's vision. Now, this is where I think we can find some additional wisdom in this text. Beyond the trim and tidy call story, this text tells us that we can do hard things. And it is a reminder that even when we mess up, God can still use us. Even with all his faults, God uses Eli. We often only focus on Samuel's eagerness to be used by God. Here I am. Here I am. We often overlook the status and experience that Eli brings, even with his faults, to help Samuel discern. Without Eli directing Samuel on what to say, do, or even being a truth teller, Samuel may not have ever known it was God who was calling. Even in all of his corruption, Eli is useful in directing Samuel. 
Even though Eli, Eli may have lost his way, he does recognize God's voice. Even in our failures, God continues to use us. Praise be for that. This is a meaningful reminder to us in a world where we can often be so hard on ourselves. When we often let our mistakes hold us hostage or we let our circumstances hold us back from the positive impact that we can make. These things don't have to define us. We can change course and seek something new. We can choose to navigate a different way. Eli is actually not the best example of correcting course and navigating a different way. As a matter of fact, if you keep reading through chapter four, you see that he seems to be held hostage and relinquishes himself to the fact that God has made up God's mind about his future. But our sacred text is full of stories of how people have moved past their messes to allow God to use them. Peter denies Jesus but becomes the rock of the church. Paul, before his conversion, persecuted the church but goes on to be an incredible missionary. Even Zacchaeus had an unsavory job as the tax collector and decided to give away half of his possessions. These are examples of those who have repented and reflected and turned back toward God. As humans, we tend to place ourselves as the hero of the story. We all want to be Samuel. But maybe we've dabbled in a little bit of Eli too. We mess up, we lose our way. But let us not be held hostage. God is calling us and God continues to use us. May we be willing to lean in. And may we exercise Eli's wisdom and respond by saying, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Amen.